everyone uh, to the PhD days of the PhD program in economics and business of the University of Cagliari. I'm Vittorio Pelligra, I'm the coordinator of the program, and uh, I, I want to immediately give the floor to the director of our department to, to a brief introduction, a greeting. Uh, please, uh, Professor Brown. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Vittorio, and uh, good evening to, to everybody, and good morning for our special guest from <coughs> on the other side of, of the ocean. And just a few words to welcome you on this uh, new year. And it's, uh, I'm very pleased to see that our uh, PhD program is organizing uh, this initiative and this start is in this uh, uh, nice, nice way. And then I'm very happy for that. I'm not directly involved in the, in the PhD, but uh, I enjoy that my colleagues are working uh, in such a good way for, for improving it. And of course, uh, welcome to the old and new students and to the new colleagues in the, in, in the PhD committee for, for, for this year. Um, I, I would say that my my words is not that important, and it's uh, uh, time to to switch and to welcome our special guest. And uh, thanks to to Christina, thanks to Vittorio for your engagement in, the, in our uh, PhD. And and that's it. I uh, hope that uh, the new year will be plenty of of good things for, for everybody after, after the, the last one, very difficult for us and you guys. Okay, thanks, thanks Rinaldo. Um, uh, as, as you may know, this uh, PhD days is a, is a sort of three day seminar, uh, which is an important moment for our student and for our community, uh, but for our student in particular, because they share their research with the faculty and uh, with the, the other students. So it's an important uh, occasion to, to, to get to know each other and uh, to get to know what uh, the, their research uh, interests uh, are. And, uh, but it's also an important moment because uh, we welcome the new students that, 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 that they, uh, they have just finished their long and sometimes painful admission admission process. So uh, a very warm welcome to the, 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 the new uh, first year students. Uh, there will be lots of uh, occasion to, to, to know each other and to, to, to get in touch. Uh, but it's also an important moment uh, because each year we ask an invited speaker uh, to give uh, inaugural uh, lecture and uh, um, we are sure that we th th this year lecture will be both exciting and inspiring for uh, for all our students and uh, but also for many of our uh, colleagues so i'm very glad to introduce this year's speaker uh, who is uh, christina christina Bicchieri. Uh, just a few words. Uh, Christina has uh, an impressive, uh, very long CV, so it's difficult to summarize uh, her contribution and her career, but I'll try to say something uh, very essential. Uh, she's the S.J. Patterson Harvey Professor of Social Thoughts and Comparative Ethics, but also Professor of Philosophy and Psychology, Professor, professor of Legal Studies at Wharton School, uh, head of uh, Behavioral Ethics Lab, uh, director of the philosophy, PPE, Philosophy, Politics and Economics program, and also director of the Master of Behavioral and Decision Science at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she holds different appointments from different universities, uh, Columbia, I think, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and, uh, and some, some other. Uh, she's a philosopher by training, 
and uh, with a BA from Milan and a PhD from Cambridge University in philosophy as well, I think. Of science. (laughs) (laughs) Which is different. (laughs) And her first contribution are in philosophy of science. I I remember the first first book of yours that I I read was about, uh, uh, was reason to believe uh, in itself. Yeah, Yeah. by uh, published by Nelly, a uh, small but very inspiring book uh, in, in philosophy of science. And the, 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 the topic is very similar to epistemic game theory, I think. You know, there are a lot of, of, of links uh, because uh, her research lies at the intersection between philosophy, game theory, psychology, experimental and behavioral economics, and, you know, uh, behavioral sciences in, in, in general, judgment and decision-making, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, but in, in recent years, uh, she has become a leading figure in the study of social uh, norms in particular, the dynamic and the evolution of social norm, uh, such as reciprocity, fairness, uh, uh, cooperation, and how they evolve and promote behavioral change. And um, what is particularly noteworthy, I think, is that this interest is not just academic. Uh, Christina, in fact, has been involved in many uh, initiatives promoted by public and private organizations, such as UNICEF, the World Bank, the Bill and Melissa Gates Foundation, uh, to help those institutions to develop programs aimed at improving the living conditions of people and population in the less developed countries. And um, she's also given contribution uh, 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 to the contemporary debate about, uh, which is a very hot topic right now, uh, about the libertarian paternalism and nudging literature. And uh, that's the, 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 I think the topic of this, uh, today's lecture, the focus will be on the relation between norms and, and nudges, in fact. Uh, I don't want to take uh, more time to, the, to, to, the, our, uh, to our guest. Uh, I want to thank you once again for her kindness and for her uh, uh, nice uh, uh, disponibility, availability to, to, to uh, give this lecture to our students. So, Christina, thanks again. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and talking to young students. And uh, let me see, without much ado, let me try to share my screen. Okay, do you see everything? Yeah. Perfect. So, as uh, um, Vittorio was saying, the title is uh, Norms and Nudges, and in particular is the relationship between nudging, I come to it in a second, and uh, the creation or the emergence of social norms. Okay, so uh, nudges, many of you may know if you read the book, uh, uh, you know, the 2008 book of uh, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, Uh, is the idea of a gentle push, (laughs) you know. So reframing the choice environment, they call it the choice architecture, to direct behavior uh, in, uh, you know, in a more positive, uh, in a more positive way. And the interesting thing is uh, that it is conceived as a cheaper way to do that, to change behavior, cheaper with respect to uh, using economic incentives, both positive or negative, okay? And uh, uh, let me give you a few very, very common example. Uh, Yes? Uh, Common example that have been uh, used uh, um, quite successfully. One is, uh, saving more in uh, uh, what we call 401k plans. Um, These are pension plans where, uh, you know, the the company or the university in our case, uh, you know, puts a certain percentage of the salary, but then can match 
what you put, uh, and very few people were doing that. And so the idea is how can we induce people to behave in a better way, more, you know, uh, uh, more uh, uh, efficient for them. Okay, they save more money. And again, nudging was very successful. And uh, why was it successful? Simply because uh, uh, they made it uh, sort of mandatory, okay? Uh, the default, not mandatory in a, uh, in a strong sense, but the default was uh, that uh, uh, you match what uh, the university puts there. If you don't want, you write no please. And uh, most people didn't write no please, they did it. Okay, and this is an example. There are many, many others. In Austria, for example, they created a default for donating or organs uh, after you die in an accident or whatnot. The Encourage trial is very famous again because it is about adhering, you know, to taking your medication uh, every day on time, etc., etc. Now, all these examples are examples in which you try to induce behavior that benefits the agent, the performer, okay? You will be more healthy. You will have more money uh, when you retire and so on and so forth versus instead inducing uh, what we care a lot about, which is behaviors that are beneficial to the society at large. Okay, now how we do nudging uh, to basically benefit society at large or large groups in society? Well, it's done by providing information about what other people do, and or what other people approve or disapprove of, okay? So these nudges work to what we call social comparison. So you compare yourself to what other people do or what they approve or disapprove of. For example, Holsworth in England uh, did a very successful uh, nudge by alerting taxpayers, sending information to taxpayer that the majority of taxpayer pays on time and they were quite successful. Uh, the, the famous driving feedback in Bogota, in Bogota, uh, when Antanas Mokus was mayor, uh, you know, people drive like crazy. There were a lot of accidents within the city, in the center of the city, people died. And so what they tried uh, was uh, to alert people and try to make people aware that they are driving in a very bad way. And so there were sort of mimes going around with, uh, uh, you know, little cards, green thumb up, red thumb down, and they gave good driver the green thumb up and the other got the red one. And, uh, you know, people uh, like to be uh, thought well by other people. So everybody wants the green thumb up. <laughs> and so basically, you know, they succeeded in inducing better um, driving behavior. Now, what is the necessary assumption when you do this kind of social nudging? Is that target behavior are interdependent. What do I mean by behavior being interdependent? It means that people's preference for doing a certain behavior is conditional on their social expectations. So it is conditional for what they believe other people do or believe they should do and so on and so forth. So without this conditionality, nudging would fail. So how do I define a norm nudge? Is a nudge whose mechanism of action that functions relying on eliciting, on creating social expectation with the goal of inducing desirable behavior. Always under the assumption that preference, people preference for performing the target behavior, the behavior you want them to perform are conditional on social expectation. So the big idea of norm nudging is you have to change expectation if they are there, certain expectation you want to change them, or if they aren't there, you want to induce them, okay? And what sort of expectation? 
I divide expectation into big, big, uh, two big types. Empirical, so other people to do, what sort of actions they take, and normative, what you expect others to approve or disapprove, not what you approve or disapprove, this is very important, what you believe others approve or disapprove, because very often we're very sensitive to this approval or disapproval by other people. Okay. Now, there are several requirements for nudging to be effective. And uh, I always suggest, uh, especially when I do uh, consulting, et cetera, uh, you know, yeah, we can do nudging, but before doing nudging, we have to be sure that certain things are in place. And uh, the first thing we have to be able to correctly identify the mechanism through which different type of information affect behavior. In this case, will empirical information uh, be important? Should we do that? Should we do normative? Should we do both? Well, we have to know uh, a priori which one will be more effective. And to do that, we have to understand what motivates specific behavior. Think of littering. Very interesting because the city of Philadelphia you know, has a behavioral unit like many American cities and many governments. And so they were very obsessed with the fact that in certain area of the city, there is a lot of littering. Okay. And uh, what they thought is, well, we have to put, uh, you know, more trash cans. There are more trash cans. People will litter less. Use the trash can. They didn't. And so my question, because when they ask me well, what's happening, I say, well, did you ask yourself why people litter? Do they litter because, uh, you know, is inconvenient not to. There are no trash cans, so of course they throw in the street, or because they observe other people littering, okay? Maybe there is a cost to go to the trash can, it's not just in front of your house. And if you see more people littering, you litter too. So the motivation for the behavior is very important to understand, otherwise you fail with your nudge. And also it's important to understand the context in which the behavior occurs. I will come to that later. Okay, so we want to open a little bit the black box of nudging. Nudging usually is a little bit of a black box. You know, you, you have an input, you get an output in positive, negative, but we don't know really why. And uh, so what motivates behavior is very important. You know, before you do the nudge, you have to know, you know, why you do the nudge, what to do with the nudge. And uh, in this case, you have to diagnose behavior. As I say, with the littering, did you diagnose if it is, you know, social limitation or if it is because there is no trash can behind, you know, my house. And uh, so to diagnose behavior, you need to measure a few things. You have to measure social expectations, empirical and normative. You have to measure reference networks. Why? Because expectations are not expectation in a vague sense what others do, but uh, with littering is what people in my neighborhood do. So the reference network is the people that you look at, you imitate, you care about, you know, uh, with respect to target behavior. And also to measure if there is uh, causality, if this conditional, pre if there are conditional preferences, if I prefer to, uh, you know, uh, not litter, you know, if I have certain expectation and otherwise I will prefer to litter. Okay. So empirical and normative, uh, I told you what they are. Empirical, what I believe other do in a similar situation. Normative, what I believe others, these normative are second order beliefs, because a normative belief typically is my own belief. I should not litter. The normative expectation is I believe other believe one should not litter. And they may be very different from my personal belief. It's very important and still be more important than my personal normative belief in inducing behavior. Okay. Again, I told you what the reference network is. And again, we have to be very careful because reference network vary from one situation, one target behavior to another, okay? 
and uh, we have to be able to know what these networks are. That's why in my work on norms and measuring norms, I do mostly measurement, we also measure reference networks, okay? Uh, usually we do surveys and uh, uh, basically to tailor the survey, I have to know who the reference network is for these people, okay? And, uh, you know, there are various methods to unearth the reference network or the plural reference network that matter to particular behavior. And the important thing is that you have to know how information travels through the network. Maybe very slow, maybe very fast. This is very important for results, okay? And uh, when we design an intervention, okay, and analyze data, it's very, very important that we have done the measurement of the network. Otherwise, uh, you know, and I will show you with examples how this can be really, really impairing our research. Another important point is, suppose we're very successful with intervention in one community. Because the network in this community is very different from the network in another apparently similar community, you know, translating or transporting the same kind of intervention in the other community may be a failure. And we have to be aware of that and alert to that problem, okay? Because again, when we measure network, we may know, oh, in this other community, their network structure, the topology of the network is very different. This is very important. Now, the last, the last thing is uh, for, doing, uh, uh, for doing this kind of analysis, uh, for nudging, uh, conditional preferences are crucial, okay? And so, the kind of question we ask to decide whether social preferences are conditional or not, we ask, do these expectations that we have measured matter to behavior? Are they causally relevant? If the answer is positive, we know that changing expectation will change behavior. If the answer is negative, well, save your money. It doesn't matter, okay? Another reason that uh, we want, uh, you know, to study conditionality is that certain may matter more than other. So we know, for example, I will show you that empirical expectation, expectation about what other people do, what you expect them to do, usually matter more than the normative, what you expect them to approve or disapprove. And if there is incongruence between the two, people tend to follow the empirical, not the normative. Okay, so if there is conditionality, okay, norm nudging, provided you do the right measurement beforehand, norm nudging will be successful. Why? Because norm nudging is supposed to change expectations. Okay. So when we, when we say we have to understand social behavior before, beforehand, we have, uh, I show you this, we have to understand if there is social conditionality or not. Why? Because measuring expectation is not enough. Because we can have normative empirical expectation, etc. Suppose uh, you are a religious person and a religious person will have certain normative expectation. I think my community approves of going to church and so on and so forth. And empirically, my community people go to church. But is my own decision to go to church dependent of this expectation? Probably not. And typical of moral behavior is moral behavior is unconditional. It's not dependent on what I think other people do, what I think they approve or disapprove of. It's not conditional on that, okay? Customs. You know, I, I, I always have the example of opening an umbrella when it rains. Of course, I expect other people to do that. But uh, does it make me open an umbrella because other people do that? No, I open an umbrella because I want to be dry. So custom and moral rules are typical example. In one case, uh, you know, empirical expectation matter. In the other case, uh, it may be 
you know, both empirical and, uh, and normative, you know, in those cases, there is no conditionality. This expectation that exists, plain or all. Okay, so when you measure expectations, you must also be careful to measure, you know, the level at which they may or may not cause behavior. This is very important. To the right, you see instead the interdependent behavior. You know, expectations matter to choice. Descriptive norms, for example, I prefer to drive on the right of the road because I expect everybody to do that. And on top of that, I expect everybody who drives, you know, to expect me to do that. There are mutual empirical expectations. It's basically empirical expectation, any convention, okay? And any other descriptive norm, like a fashion, a fad or whatnot, uh, you know, they can be mutual or just one way. It doesn't matter. Empirical expectation play the only crucial role there. Okay, there is conditionality based on empirical expectation. Social norms are the most interesting case. Social norms, you need also a normative push. Why? The social norms are there, okay, to uh, benefit the group, to benefit society or, or a group if they are group norms. And why do we have social norms? Exactly because we are no angels and very often following a social norm, like a norm of fairness, for example, you know, or uh, simply the norm of using less water. If you live in California during the summer, there are droughts, you know, you have to use less water. It's costly, sometimes a big cost, sometimes a little cost, but there is a cost. And so the empirical expectation is not enough. You know, you need that a little normative push. And so social norm combine empirical and normative expectation, okay? And of course, uh, uh, conditional preference. So descriptive and social norm to the right are typical examples of uh, interdependence where norm nudging can have an important role, okay? And here you see norm nudging to the right where uh, preference are conditional. Simple nudges may work very well. Simple nudges, not norm nudging. Simple nudges, for example, uh, with custom or moral norms. With moral norm, a simple nudge may be a nudge that uh, make people think, oh, yes, this is the right thing to do. Okay, remind us of what we already think is the right thing to do, for example. Now, so I said, socially descriptive norm are, you know, crucial to norm nudging. However, do we need different intervention if it is a descriptive norm versus a social norm? So when you want to change, which happened in Sweden, uh, the way in which people drive from the left as it used in England and remained stable in England to the right, as is happening in most of Europe and Sweden was moving to that. And so the kind of intervention was a massive campaign of information, media, you know, television, newspaper, radio, et cetera, et cetera, to coordinate, because you need just to coordinate behavior on a different, on a different target, if you will. Now, if instead you want you know, uh, to intervene on people picking their dog litter, okay? Is the intervention the same? No, because picking the dog litter has a little cost, okay? You have to take a bag, you have, you know, to pick it up, put it in the bag, dispose of the bag, and so on and so forth. So uh, what's happening is that here you need some extra inducement, which is the normative inducement. And the normative inducement is, well, in your neighborhood, people think that you should do that. And so you feel that if you go out and don't do that and people observe you, you know, they may disapprove of you, they may shun you, etc. And so clearly the type of intervention for this very different descriptive versus social norm will be quite different, okay? Now, in the case of norm nudging, you may nudge a simple descriptive norm, which would be really simpler, okay? 
when you want to nudge a social norm, okay, the big question is how we change or induce both type of expectation, the empirical and the normative. And we will see some example. Okay. Very often norm nudging has been done using empirical information only. Okay. For example, you compare uh, the electricity use of each household, household to the electricity use of the neighbors. Okay. And Alcott has a very famous research and paper on that, is a field study, and this reduced consumption. Or uh, another uh, Goldstein and company did a very nice experiment in which they tell hotel guests that most other guests reuse their towels, don't throw them away. And uh, this is a more interesting case I will come back to later. More, more guests then reuse the, tape, uh, the, the towels. Now, there is, uh, there is uh, a problem here that, uh, first of all, we don't know why this effect was positive. There can be many reasons why it was positive, but we don't know because the typical nudging is uh, done with the black box, you know, out, input, output. Works, great, doesn't work, who knows? but we don't even know why it works, okay? And another very, very important point is that the effects of this nudging are usually short-lived. They don't last through time, you know? The, the lower electricity or water also consumption is not permanent, you know? It declines quite fast, okay? Now, so if, even if there is a success, the success may be short-lived, and even worse, we don't know why there was a success. There are also a lot of failure. For example, language matters. Schulz and, uh, and colleagues, you know, compared electricity consumption to neighbors. But the language they use, they said, the average electricity consumption is X, Y, Z. Now, what happens? You have an average, and suppose you are below that average. You know that you consume less at that average. So everybody who consumes less tend to consume more. And the people who consume more went a little bit down, but not much. And so what happened is that the average was increased. So it was, it was not, uh, it was not a, good, a good design. Context matters. When the Goldstein experiment done with hotels in the US was replicated in the European Union, Austria, and some other country, it backfired, it didn't work. And uh, they really didn't know why it's not working here again, because uh, they, they did not understand what motivates people to do or not do something, you know, in a place, uh, in a context or in another context. Now, failures also may be due to misunderstanding the relevant reference network. That's why at the beginning I say, you have to measure the reference network. You have to be sure this is the relevance network, okay? So for example, when I was working with UNICEF about child nutrition in Sub-Saharan Africa, okay, the typical intervention was, well, let's give young mothers all the information we can about newborn nutrition and how it's important to give colostrum to uh, the first milk to the newborn. And, uh, you know, uh, people didn't understand uh, the network and who's the decision maker in the network is the mother-in-law. And they never address the mother-in-law beliefs, ideas, behavior, and therefore they failed uh, miserably, okay? Uh, another reason uh, why it is uh, important to specify the relevant reference network is because we have uh, people, but we, oh, we are people, have the tendency to provide self-serving interpretation. And uh, I go back to the guests and towels. So there were three different experiments 
One said, guest in hotel rooms in America, you know, uh, tend to reuse the towels. The second was guest in this hotel tend to reuse. And the third was very specific. My student call it, well, is, is really, uh, you know, uh, quite, quite disgusting. <laughs> they say, why? Creepy. They said creepy. Why? Guests in your room, 325, uh, tend to reuse their towels. This third information, kind of information, had the most effect. The first, a guest in hotels in America had little effect. Why? Well, exactly because you may think you want clean towels, okay? And so what do you think? You tell me guest in hotels in America. Well, I am in a nice hotel, maybe guest in motels do that, but, you know, I am in a nice hotel. And so there is a self-serving interpretation of this information, which is ambiguous. So ambiguous information uh, is better never to give it because people will twist it and interpret it as they wish. A great example of a very good analysis of reference network is Holtzworth uh, basically intervention on, uh, in, in England, uh, general practitioner, doctors, you know, there were some that were over-prescribing antibiotics. And the information was true that uh, those, uh, uh, those GPs were informed that 80% of GPs in their area, very important, in their area, they had no excuse that, uh, you know, well, they prescribe less in Scotland because there is more clean air than in London. So in their area, uh, you know, prescribe less antibiotics. And this effectively reduced the prescription, okay? Another example instead of, uh, uh, and we, we have been subject to that all the time, is early COVID government media messages, okay? And the message initially was that uh, the people who will be really, really uh, impacted will be old people, will be people with pre-existing conditions, and so on and so forth. And so a young person may normally think, well, this is not my reference network. I'm healthy, I'm young, and so I can do whatever I want. So it's very, very important to tailor the message to the reference network that you want to address. Another reason is uh, uh, the messenger may not be trusted or credible. And uh, we have, if I have time, I can discuss a recent article we published on uh, uh, nine different countries in which we show that even, um, you know, if you are successful in creating empirical and normative expectation about good rules of behavior with COVID-19, if there is no trust in science, not government, in science, you know, the message will be lost. Finally, uh, the, basically the message, the information may be inconsistent with the beliefs that people have. You have to be very careful not to give messages that are too far away from what people believe they will not listen. Okay. Now, and these are... Uh, uh, yes? Ten, ten minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, uh, well. then, well, because it took 15 minutes to start. All right. Uh, then the, the issue is uh, normative only uh, information. So uh, some are effective, other people, uh, you know, uh, do this and that and sort of believe that one should do that. Uh, but you know, uh, if they are incongruent with empirical expectation, uh, this, uh, uh, this is going to be a problem. For example, if uh, uh, we uh, know, we are told that most people bribe, but we are also told that people really disapprove that, what do you think they do? They bribe, is an inducement to bribe. 
So this normative message, you know, can be uh, really damaging if they are incongruent with what people really expect to happen. And uh, I, I uh, leave, uh, well, this is very important to understand, okay? Ambiguous information leads to what we call moral wiggle room. Again, if it is ambiguous, I can interpret as I like, okay? Uh, second, mentioning that many people engage in a bad behavior can normalize it. Com corruption campaigns usually fail exactly because they do that. They normalize bad behavior. They tell you how many people are corrupt. It gives us permission to be corrupt, basically. And in particular, what happens, and this is a study, but there is not, not much time to do that. I did recently some experiments on social information and the kind of inference we draw when we receive social information, okay? And when the information about how common it is, negative behavior, okay, people infer that it is approved, okay? That, you know, people support it. So they infer from the empirical, the normative in negative behavior. However, Okay, disapproval of negative behavior. So if I tell you people really disapprove of bribing, does not imply, does not lead to a parallel inference, they will not do that. Okay, so there is an asymmetry between the type of information, positive and negative, normative and empirical that you give. Okay, and I, I leave uh, this experiment uh, uh, because I, I don't have time, but I can show you. Uh, we did uh, an, an experiment on norm inference, okay? Using a two by two factorial between subject design. So we randomized for each person the order of 23 behaviors, okay? And for each behavior, you were randomly assigned to one of the four conditions, empirical positive, normative positive, empirical negative, normative negative. And what I, I tell you is the following, I give people vignette. So you may receive the empirical positive vignette and they say, in this new city, which we randomly chose, most residents drive below the speed limit. How many do you think say in this place that it is appropriate? to do that. So I give empirical information and I want to infer normative information in a positive environment. Some other person, we receive the normative positive condition. In this city, most say it is approved. It, it is appropriate, they approve to drive below the speed limit. How many do you think, how many do you infer do that? And the empirical negative is, Exactly, the specular image, the opposite. In this new city, most people drive above the speed limit. How many do you think approve of it versus uh, in this new city, most residents say it is okay to do that and how many do that? And uh, this is the most important thing to look at, the right one, okay? So when the behavior is positive, there is a very strong inference from the empirical to the normative. Example, if I tell you most people um, in this particular country uh, pay taxes on time, how many do you think do that? What's the percentage? If I've given you the first message, people will infer most people do that, uh, approve of that, sorry. Most people do what most of People approve of that. It's a positive behavior, they approve of that. If I give you the normative information, most people approve of pay taxes on time. Well, how many people do you think they do? It will be not the majority, the, the total majority, maybe like 50, 60%. So the inference, there is an asymmetry from the empirical to the normative versus the normative to the empirical in the positive behavior. This is reverse for the normative behavior. What does it mean? That if I tell you 
uh, for the negative behavior, sorry. If I tell you most people don't pay their taxes in time in this particular country, uh, do, do you infer they approve of that? You know, the inference is, uh, you know, yes, they approve of that, but it's not that strong. In, if instead I tell you most people approve of not paying taxes on time, you know, they will infer, well, and they don't, they don't do that. So there is still an asymmetry is turned in the complete uh, different direction. So there are two types of asymmetries. There are asymmetries between the empirical and uh, the normative, and there are asymmetries between the positive and uh, the negative. And uh, for example, for cheating, cutting in line, taxation, littering, uh, we find uh, this uh, relationship. However, there are outliers. For example, vaccine, vaccination, uh, you know, on the positive, there is the asymmetry but not in the negative, you can imagine why. Bribing the same and is interesting because one of the questions for bribing was, you know, in America, we had a big bribing scandal of parents bribing university officers to get their children accepted in the university, okay? And so if I tell people, most people believe that it's permissible to bribe to, bribe to get into college, okay, or bribing government to obtain a contract, they don't immediately believe that it is in fact done, that it is common. Why? Because people are not stupid. The fact that it is common is conditional on the possibility that people can pay the bribe, and very few people can pay half a million uh, to an admission officer in a college to get their children accepted, okay? So the inference is an outlier here, it's not the typical inference, oh, they believe it is permissible then they do that because, you know, they know that uh, uh, this behavior is uncommon because there are economic, uh, economic issues here, okay? So we can explain the outliers by, you know, uh, observability, frequency, level of agreement, et cetera, et cetera. We have a new paper that uh, we hope is coming out. Okay, uh, this is, how much time do I have? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, uh, so as I said, we have a double asymmetry norm inference. Why this is important? This is important because when you do norm nudging, Okay, you have to pay attention to the inference that people draw from the information you send them. Okay, so when you send empirical information, pay attention, is it positive, is it negative? It will have a different effect on the inference that people make. And I have this experiment to prove that. I also have an experiment in which we show that China and the US, people draw different inferences. Not in every case, but in many important cases, they do. And this is very important because it is culturally sensitive. We never think about that, but cultural sensitivity is a very important element when you do not nudging, okay? And so the findings uh, that we are presenting suggest that both the direction and the strength of the association is modulated by the valence of the behavior, whether the behavior is positive or negative. So we have different asymmetries and uh, uh, you know, the valence of the behavior is one important, uh, one important part. Uh, now, um, I wanted to show this, but there is no time. Anyway, is a paper that is published on PLOS One. I am the first author and is a paper about nudging and COVID-19 behavior. And basically what we show on nine different countries, so China, Colombia, Germany, Italy, Mexico, South Korea, Spain, and you know, a lot of countries, we did uh, representative surveys 
we uh, gave a vignette to understand if there is a causal connection between expectation and behavior. And of course there is, but the interesting thing is when we measure also trust, so one may say, hey, great, if we can change people's expectations, if we can induce people's expectation about good behavior, ah, we have solved the problem of you know, following COVID rules. Not so fast. Okay. What happens is uh, uh, that, uh, sorry, if we look at trust, we measure all this stuff and we see that giving people a high expectation will induce them to behave in a very positive way. And we say, okay, let's look at the relationship between nudging and trust. And we look at trust in government and scientists, and we see that trust in science is the lowest possible one in the US. Okay, it's average, but it's, uh, it's telling. Okay, and uh, normally trust in science is always greater than trust in government, apart from China. And, probably uh, it was to be expected, but it's interesting in the US, uh, trust in uh, uh, science is very low. And uh, you know, it goes from one to four and 298 is not, is not very high. Now it's interesting, uh, what happens if uh, we have induced high expectation in people, okay, but we want to measure whether they trust or not trust science. So they have high expectation, nudging was successful, but will it work? And we see that uh, trust in science maximizes compliance. And whenever there is low trust in science, compliance declines. This is very important, why? Because when you study nudging and you try to nudge people into behaving in a better way, especially better for the collective, for society, there are moderators. And trust, in this case in science, is an important moderator. And remember one thing, that this is not just a, a problem with COVID. Global warming is another area where trust in science is crucial. And you may nudge people as much as you want, okay, on compliance with certain target behavior. But if, and you can change their expectations. But the problem is if there is very little trust in science, your work will not be successful. And uh, so uh, let's come to the conclusion is that behavior many behavior are interdependent. So, you know, nudging will be effective when behavior are interdependent, conditional on expectation and information. But the effectiveness is dependent upon several factors, avoiding uncertainty in the message, choosing the appropriate reference network, using trusted messenger to convey information. So if, if the scientist is not trusted, science is not trusted, you have a problem, giving public example of positive behavior. If we believe that, that there is a lot of negative behavior around, try to give positive example, you know, in a very public way, and especially consider the asymmetry between empirical and normative information. Okay, so positive versus negative matters. Commonness of negative behavior can imply approval of it. So the more common, okay, the more approved. It's not true maybe, but that's what people infer. And disapproval of negative behavior doesn't imply that then they behave in a positive way, not at all, okay? And last but not least, when you have a conflict incongruence between normative and empirical information, the empirical will be more powerful than the normative. And here I stop. I'm sorry I couldn't show you more example, but you know. Thank you, Christina. I of the essence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I would make 
a, a big applause, virtual applause <laughs> from the audience. Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'm representing the feelings of all the, 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 the audience. Um, thanks, thanks again very much for uh, this um, encompassing uh, uh, synthesis of this, this very huge literature uh, which has uh, so many policy implication, I would say, not just not just you know uh, theoretical or um, empirical. So th thank you, thank you very much. Just a brief comment before uh, giving the, the the mic to the to the audience for you know, a few questions. Uh, I was very much impressed by the this idea of uh, opening the black box of, uh, yes. of Nudge because you know one of the the I think the ingredient for the success of the nudging rhetoric is uh, that it's very simple it, it appears to be very simple you now change the choice architecture you know few details and you can uh, all, almost magically achieve what uh, behavior change uh, yeah. you, you prefer. So I think this can be even dangerous in some, in some respect. And uh, one of the implications of what you said is the, the, the aspect of the cultural dependence of this kind of intervention. And I think it's, uh, it's very much yeah. important to understand this and in your toolbox in somehow, somehow uh, account for this uh, cultural dependence because uh, it, it is focused on the underlying mechanism of behavioral change, not on the tools. So, and that's very much important, uh, especially today when, uh, when we are uh, very much aware of the weird problem. Okay, um, in the sense of uh, of John uh, Heinrich, uh, Joe Heinrich, uh, 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 critique to our uh, results. Okay, um, most uh, many of most of our um, experimental results uh, comes from from pool of subject that that are from. Uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, uh, and democratic countries, which is a we are <laughs> which represents a minority of uh, of yeah. the world population. So, if we want to develop tools that are effective uh, independently of the of the or uh, yeah, independently of the this cultural. Uh, uh, effects uh, we have to go deeper. I think uh, the understanding of of, of the yeah, link between uh, behavior, uh, expectations, interdependence, and so and so on. And I think your contribution is very uh, precious on uh, on this uh, in this sense. Um, I stop here. I think there are questions. I hope there are questions. Yeah, Andrea Isoni. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Christina, for the very nice uh, talk. Um, I have a question about your um, first set of results you presented with the negative behavior and positive behavior. And so it's just to, to check my understanding of the mechanism, really. And so in the positive behavior, is it like a recognition that, it, that it's hard to walk the line? So you know that it's a positive behavior and you may aspire to follow that behavior as, as much as you can, but it's, it's easy not to manage. So if you ask people, if you tell people, well, a lot of people think this, this, this would be good, this is the appropriate behavior, then, then the expectation is, okay, it's also a difficult thing to achieve, and therefore the underestimation. Whereas if you do the negative thing, you can say, well, clearly these are the people who fail in, in their resolution because it's a, it's a I don't know, you, you bribe, or even if it's, it's not as extreme as bribing, um, even if it, if it was a question about uh, littering, which is less, less of an offense to a certain extent, you can say, well, clearly 
they do it, but if you, if you were to ask them, they would say, well, you, you shouldn't do it. On the other hand, isn't there a possibility that there's a confound in your study uh, just as a, as a rhetorical strategy? When, when we want to imply that people don't do things, we often say, oh, this person says this, but guess, guess if this person actually does it. Um, I wonder to what extent this, this, this could be a confound in, in, in your result. Um, yes, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> good point. The cost of behavior, what you say, is confounding. Um, because, uh, uh, you know, the inference uh, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, one should, from the normative in particular, okay, uh, normative, uh, uh, positive, you know, people think one should uh, do X, Y, Z. And, uh, you know, then you see that the inference is not as strong. Okay, the normative, inf uh, the empirical inference from the should to the do is uh, weaker in the positive and is stronger in the negative. Let's just think about the inference from empirical from normative to empirical, okay? Normative positive, lower empirical positive, normative negative, higher empirical negative. So it's not just a question of cost, because in the case of the negative behavior, let's say, sure, uh, the fact, uh, uh, you know, that... Uh, certain behaviors, for example, uh, you know, if people say, oh, uh, most people uh, approve of, uh, of bribing, okay, then you say, oh, and what's the inference? How strong is the inference to most people then do bribe? It is quite... Uh, um, quite strong, even if bribing is costly, because you can be discovered, you can be, uh, you know, fined, etc. That is interesting. There is some information we get about cost from the fact that, so if there is, uh, you know, an inference that they draw from approval of negative behavior, to doing the, this negative behavior, even if the behavior is costly, because when it becomes common, it is less costly. I don't know if you remember uh, Bribesville in Italy. <laughs> and you remember that when they were interviewing managers and they said, but everybody did that. It was illegal. It was potentially costly. But the interesting thing is the commonness of the behavior was driving down the cost, okay? So the information we get about behavior, so a priori, you may think, oh, this behavior is really costly, okay? But the fact that we receive information, okay, about people approving of it, of people doing it, etc., changes our inferences. Because the commonness of approval in this case may give us a hint that then it is done, then they do it. But if they do it, if it's commonly done, then it is not as costly as I imagine it should be. So there is a cost always a priori, but the information can twist the cost, can signal something about the cost. Okay, so what you are saying is simpler. You say basically positive behavior is usually more costly than negative behavior. Well, not necessarily. Negative behavior can be very costly. Negative behavior can be fined. You know, you pay a price for doing that. The issue is the kind of inference we draw from these different behaviors, okay, may really give us the and the inference we draw gives us a signal that uh, the cost is not so high, for example. And this yeah, is I suppose, I all suppose what, what, I, what I was suggesting yeah, is, is, is more in terms of immediate versus delayed um, costs and benefits, right? So, 
So in the example you were saying about um, if you're caught bribing in an environment in which everybody's doing it, it looks like a di distant prospect because um, maybe you can't recall of anybody being caught bribing and so on. Whereas the benefit is, is more immediate. Suppose that that would be, um, in, in the sense is similar to the uh, sort of time inconsistency kind of trade-offs. So the temptation, the temptation of, of this behavior that can give you advantages is hard to resist, even if you've got a moral standard which tells you oh, you shouldn't do it. Whereas, whereas on the other side, it's more like, I know it's hard to aspire to these high standards. So to some extent, it's, it's a sort of similar, it's a more symmetric mechanism, if you, if you see. But maybe, maybe it's, it's just, what you're saying is just the same thing as rephrasing what I'm saying. No, no, what you say is uh, absolutely right in the case, uh, okay, when, uh, um, you know, people do positive, okay, well, people approve of that. They wouldn't do it otherwise versus people approve a positive. Mm, not so many people do that because the positive is costly. Okay, typically social norm type behavior is costly. I agree with you. There is a cost difference there. And uh, uh, the negative, uh, you know, most people approve of it uh, than probably most people do. Why? It's still there may be a cost, but the approval of that uh, signifies in my mind when I receive this information, okay, that, uh, you know, it may be common and therefore if it's common and this is your difference between the short term and long term. If it is common, then probably, you know, the fine, you know, is, is not that, uh, that coming fast to me, <laughs> you know, won't be immediate, etc. On the other hand, the negative people, you know, do this behavior, do I infer that they approve of it, okay? Uh, usually it is positive. Yes, they, they must approve of it, okay? And again, if they approve of it uh, uh, and it's negative, it's probably it signals to me that again, they must believe that the cost uh, is not significant. Okay, or for them, the cost is not significant. So there is a different perception of the cost and a different signaling also of the cost, especially with the negative behavior. I agree with you, yeah. But not if you look at all, I can send you the paper if you send me email. If you look at all 23 behaviors, they're not as simple. And these are all behaviors that I chose them because they have been widely studied in experimental economics. So it's all examples that you find in experimental economics. So, yeah, so, so I, 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 I think I can fetch the, the paper. Just one, one remark about the, the, bri the bribing thing. A few years ago, the, the master's student doing a, a dissertation on um, things like bribing uh, in, uh, in, she was from Indonesia. One thing we noticed was we had this manipulation where the first thing we asked them uh, something like your um, sort of norm, how do you think this is a good thing? Uh, how appropriate uh, is this behavior? Yeah. And when we asked that first, and then we asked them to report whether they did it, they were less likely to do it. But if we did it the other way around, it, it wasn't, it wasn't so, so there was this, this asymmetry, which I suppose is, it kind of, it's very, Closely, I can see it very closely tied to your result, but I don't want to take, uh, I think I've taken too much of, of the... Uh, yeah, one thing I want to tell you though, pay attention when you do uh, this experiment uh, with the population uh, on their culture, etc. Uh, there are lots of demand effects. And so the best way to do that is to use vignettes, okay? And don't ask the question directly to the person. So I don't ask Andrea Isoni, but I ask Andrea, well, somebody quite similar to you who lives in a, you know, very comparable community uh, is subject to this information. What do you believe the person will do? So never ask directly because directly will always tell you, oh, yes, <laughs> they do the good thing. 
But uh, no, no, in this case, it, the purpose of the study was, was a different one. So we had a reason to do that. So we were testing another nudge, which failed um, dramatically. Uh, <laughs> but then it was widely advertised, that, uh, publicized that uh, it wasn't a nudge in the first place because the data were probably fake. So it said, uh, I think you, you will know what I'm talking about. Um, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Thanks. Thank you too much time. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, uh, other questions? Yeah, Elisabetta, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, thank you. So thank you very much. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a, a lot of questions, but I, <laughs> I restrict myself with just two, two questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, I'm curious to, to know, to hear your opinion. You told us about uh, uh, the success of nudging is not lasting. And uh, I wonder if it is uh, uh, because nudge works uh, on, an, uh, on the emotional brain, let's say, rather than... Uh, uh, and working through a rational decision-making process, something like that. Can 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 it be? So uh, uh, yeah, I understand. Uh, you know, type one, type two kind of reasoning. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think that that is the reasoning because. Uh, yeah, the reason, sorry, because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, decisions we take, uh, not an enormous number, but quite a few, uh, that we do by, uh, you know, sort of uh, calm <laughs> and rational reasoning that we don't stick to. <laughs> You know, so it's not the fact uh, that we use uh, a sort of, you know, rational deliberation that uh, leads uh, to a more stable result. Okay, mm -hmm. so the stability of the result, this is a very interesting thing. I mean, understanding the dynamics, okay, how... Uh, you know, how we create, for example, I know how people can create norm. I know how people can destroy norms. You know, there are a lot of studies about that. The issue is, is it permanent? Okay. You know, what, uh, uh, what put in place a certain dynamic is not necessarily what keeps the things going. This is a very important point. So what supports, okay, your question basically is about what supports continuation of the good result? What supports the stability of a new norm once uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is formed? As an economy, any new norm is an equilibrium, okay? But is equilibrium stable? Well, not necessarily. So what makes equilibrium stable? What is the dynamic? Okay, this is a question we should ask. And this is a question we are all studying, actually. Where I, I, I have uh, some work, recent work, uh, with uh, Simon Gachter, who's a, uh, you know, an economist uh, uh, in England, and um, we're looking at uh, how rules uh, can form. But the question is, are they stable? And you, you say, well, it's type one, type two reasoning. Not necessarily, not necessarily. There are other factors that contribute to the stability or instability of a newly formed, uh, I wouldn't say rule, I just say behavior, okay? So you have to have, in some sense, uh, a stable, the, the right and stable environment. I think the environment, environment plays a crucial role, Elisabeth, and is not that much studied, you know, within which environment, you know, you create a new rule or you destroy one to create a new type of behavior. 
is not something that is very much studied. We always concentrate on, you know, changing behavior, how you change behavior, etc. But the, que the question is the stability, you know, the stability of norms or any kind of behavior is a million dollar question. <laughs> I thank you for asking that. Yeah, thank I mean, you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose uh, a lot of things that should be understood uh, inside the black box, as, as you were saying. No, yes. what is inside the black box of, of yes. the decision of, of the, the yes. outcome of the decision process? Yes. And uh, the, the the second and last question is uh, about uh, the the experiments that you show us about uh, you know the trust in the scientists and the government. Yes. I was curious to know how um, how did you do this experiment? I mean, it was uh, samples, representative samples of yes. the populations. Yes. 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 So, yeah. so what you, when you do this experiment, I tell you very briefly, uh, what you hire are very reputable survey companies. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have panels. Those, uh, selected samples. I work the a, a panels. Uh, they yeah, have panels, uh, <laughs> and you tell them, uh, you know, which panels you want, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. And in our case, we wanted really a representative sample of the population, uh, in particular by gender, by education, mm -hmm. by age, and uh, uh, by income too. Okay, so there were all these variables uh, that were uh, uh, that were collected. And uh, the interesting thing is that we wanted uh, uh, different countries, okay? Yeah, because so COVID sure. has been very common to all these countries, but uh, the kind of messages that were sent were somewhat similar. We didn't use masks in the example because there were a lot of difference about wearing masks or not wearing masks in different countries, mm. but uh, keeping a distance uh, was all very similar, okay, and try to stay home, to don't go out to do, uh, you know, useless things, <laughs> basically, non-important thing was common to all these countries. So these two messages were uh, very common. So, so we use it, it would be really interesting to know what are the reasons why, you know, the, of the differences between different trusts uh, to scientists in different countries, like Spain and Italy were quite high in the trust of two scientists and the US no. So we'll well, I, but then I'm you see, to, uh, you, you see the more. result, you see the result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the, people are, are very, very surprised. The trust in science is so low in the US. But again, it's an average. In the US, there are giants in science, but there are a lot of dwarfs. <laughs> there are states in the US where they don't, wear, they don't want to wear masks and nurses don't want to take uh, the vaccines. Nurses in hospitals, okay? So we're talking of a very different uh, right. Very different places in America. America is a, is an, an enormous country, and so don't compare with the small, our small countries in Europe. But it's very interesting that on average. But if you look at men and women in America, women in general, on average, have a much higher trust in science. All sorts of women. This is an average. Trust in science is much higher on women than in men. This is another very interesting thing to study. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so, very much. so it's very complex, but yeah. interesting. All right. Yeah. Th thank you, thank Christine. You. Thank you. Thank you all. Unfortunately, we have to stop here now because we have to leave time and space to the students <laughs> that are uh, very, very keen to to start their presentation. So. Thank you again very much, Christina. It's been a very, uh, as I said, inspiring and uh, uh, thoughtful uh, presentation. I hope we can we can have uh, many other uh, chances to interact again uh, with you. So let me say one thing: if anybody is interested in this kind of experiment. Uh, 
uh, you have my email and uh, you can write to me because I'm also very interested uh, in doing something that I am doing on these different inferences in Italy. So as I, I'm doing it in China, did it in the US, I'm very interested uh, to do in Italy, North and South. Is there a difference? Who knows? So if you are interested, I would like to collaborate with somebody in Italy. Great. Great is a is a, is a wonderful uh, wonderful. Uh, right to uh, me. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank Bye. you, all, and uh, see you soon. Uh,